Hi, I'm Kurt Frankum from Leading Saints, and you're listening to Gospel Tangents. Best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to have Kurt Frankum back on the show. He's the author of Is God Disappointed in Me? We're going to talk about this book, and we're actually going to give away not just one, not two, but three autograph copies. So uh, sign up today at gospeltangents.com slash contest. And I, uh, you can, you could be one of three winners of of this book here. So, um, it's gonna. So today's tax day, April fifteenth. Make sure you've got your taxes in. Um, that'll get you in trouble with the IRS if you don't. Also, um, make sure that uh, I will do the drawing on April twenty second, one week from today, and uh, make sure that you're you're in. And we're gonna talk about uh, whether God's disappointed in you, and. <laughs> I'll try to, you know, Kurt's one of the more orthodox guests that I've had. We'll, we'll see if we can get him to talk some heresy. We'll see. So you don't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. Welcome, everybody. I'm excited to have a podcast superstar. Could you go ahead and tell us who you are? <laughs> well, this superstar. No, uh, I'm Kurt Frankum from Leading Saints. That Most people know my voice from the Leading Saints podcast. That's right. So. You don't do much YouTube. You're, you're I'm trying, experimenting. I, I need, I'm experimenting. I need to do a lot more because the demographic you know, that we are aiming towards is a lot of them are on YouTube. I've yeah. not done a good job of developing that, but we're, we're trying. So. We'll have to consult each other. That's right. i got to learn your ways. I can help you with the YouTube. That's right. You can so. help me get a bigger <laughs> audience. Because so. yeah. your audience is like 10 times bigger than mine, I'll bet. Wow. I mean, but your ex- audience has so much more character, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we talk about all the tangents. You're just... I know. You're always... You can listen in church and yours right. and mine. Sometimes you're like, oh, I better, <laughs> better watch out. But, um, and I'm a, I'm a big fan. Maybe a lot of people don't know this, but I text you a lot. It's like, wow, that, that this and that episode was awesome. And uh, I'm always paying attention to what you're putting out. And it's always so fascinating. Sometimes... Really fascinating. I'm like, I didn't even know if people that's that was a thing. That's a concept, but sure enough, people are getting PhDs and all sorts of stuff. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I will say, one of my favorite episodes of yours was with a non-Mormon, Frank Layden. Frank Layden. That's right. <laughs> that was a while ago, but yeah. that was cool to to go to his his place and. I need to get interview. Frank on mine. Maybe you could hook. Yeah. Me up. What would he talk about, Rick? I don't know. We'll and I didn't really. Else. I mean, he'd been a. a you know, a coach. So I figured there's some leadership there, but uh, yeah. somebody connected me. I thought, yeah, let's try this. So yeah, it was yeah. awesome. It was yeah. awesome. So, and yeah, we do listen to each other's podcasts a lot. So, because we're, we're constantly texting each other. That's right. But and, you've got a new title now, and that is author. That's right. I jumped <laughs> into the, the writing world and, and I'm a published author, you can say. So. All right. So tell us the name of your book. So is, is God Disappointed in Me? Removing Shame from a Gospel of Grace. So. Okay, so you're turning Lutheran on us or what? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, this is it's, you know you, you have a unique perspective about this. Just the people you talk to that um, I think it'll make for a, a unique interview. But uh, no, I'm I'm fully is I'm as orthodox as you get, right? Because you know when it comes to being a Latter Day Saint, and uh, and a lot of people wonder, well, why didn't I write a leadership book? Because I'm like the leadership guy. But right. in in my opinion, the concepts. That I talk about in the book, there's, it is at the core of leadership. Like if you don't understand the dynamics of shame, the dynamics of grace, and you try and be a leader, like you're, you will struggle uh, to as a leader if you don't understand grace. Uh, and so that was my attempt. Is I didn't want to write a leadership book. I want to write a book about the redemptive power of our restored gospel, so that uh, it's it's worth, um, you know, encouraging people towards. So. Well, very good. So I was going to ask you that. So do you come across a lot of people who think God is disappointed in them? Is that why you wrote the book? Well, yes, for sure. There's, I mean, just my personal experience and just broadly speaking, it seems like obviously a lot of people are leaving faith. A lot of people are leaving the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. And sometimes as you listen to why they're leaving, sometimes I get the feeling of like, you are leaving a church that I never joined. Like, your experience of the church is so different from mine, and why is that? Um, or they'll, they'll, they'll state things that you know that are that are so uh, they're framed so poorly. Like, why would anybody want to join a church that 
uh, separates families and, you know, just these negative connotations that we Oh, like get. in heaven, you mean? Yeah, yeah, in heaven, that like the empty chair in heaven, I call it the empty chair fallacy, and all these ways I'm like, why are you framing the gospel like that? That's nowhere near the way I understand it, but I can understand if you really believe that, why you would want to to leave the church, right? Um, so I wanted, to, especially that those Latter-day Saints who just feel simply overwhelmed by their gospel experience. They're doing all the things, the temple attendance, the callings, and obviously it's usually a very orthodox crowd who sort of gets to this breaking point of, I just can't do this anymore. And so I'm either I'm either going to kind of quietly step back or, um, you know, this is sort of when a lot of the topics sometimes you discuss, the, the tangents become toxic, and they're like, no, I'm done with it all. I'm leaving, and it breaks my heart because this... The, our theology, in my opinion, is so redemptive, so expansive, and it should be so encouraging for people. And to, in my life, I'm just so encouraged, and I feel so redeemed and loved as I engage in in temple work and you know in in our weekly worship services and things. and um, And I want that for everybody. So I wanted to attempt to articulate that in a book that the shame is the problem. If we get that out of the equation and focus on the grace, like we will keep people engaged in the gospel. Yeah. Now, and I want to say this because I know you claim to be super orthodox, <laughs> and you are. I'm not, I'm not saying that yeah. you're not. But I have been pretty surprised about your podcast about getting into things like pornography and drug use and suicide. Not that because... we're producing pornography or doing drugs, but... <laughs> But yeah, we touch on those topics. Yeah, so you approach it from a leader's, a bishop, you know, a, a person in the congregation comes, I've got a problem with pornography or drug yeah. use or I have suicidal thoughts. And so it's great because, you know, I'm so far out there, ain't no way I'm getting in the bishopric. I have been membership clerk, so I guess that kind of counts as as bishopric. Oh, it's a shame. You would be a great bishop, right? So <laughs> you would. Not in Utah County. <laughs> okay. <All right. laughs> but oh, and by the way, you're in Utah County now. Yeah, we're I'm practically re- neighbors. Yep, yeah, they they sucked me in. I thought I would never happen, but I'm here. So But I love that you, from a very orthodox point of view, are willing to tackle subjects. I mean, we do have, occasionally you'll have a fifth Sunday lesson on, hey, if you have a problem with pornography, here's how we can resolve this. But you tackle that more often than just fifth Sundays. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and can you talk about how that ties in with shame in your book? Yeah. So, um, you know, I guess, broadly speaking, with leading saints, we we strive to create content that will help Latter-day Saints be better prepared to lead. And I remember being the bishop, sitting in on, you know, my week, you know, Tuesday night visits, seeing my schedule, and I didn't know, I knew the name of the person walking in, but I didn't know what they were going to bring up or lay on my desk and say, fix it, you know? And so I, I want, it was so helpful when somebody did bring up a topic and I had some perspective, not that I had the perfect perspective or understanding, but at least I had a perspective of how to talk about this and process it, or I've read some things or listened to experts so that I could then approach it in a helpful way for that individual. So with um, with shame and grace, like, and, and maybe this is a, 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 a framing uh, that would be helpful for our audience is that, because uh, a lot of people, just a couple days ago, I got an email from a bishop okay. who loved the book. I'm sure you get a lot of bishops to email yes. in you. Oh, I, got, I get occasional, you would love to but see not very email. often. Yeah. Um, but he read the book, and obviously I'm, I'm making a bold assertion here, because my argument in here, if you haven't figured this out, is that I believe God uh, has never been disappointed in any of us. In fact, he is incapable of being disappointed. And we can go into that. And, uh, but And he sort of heard that, like, well, I can go to the general conference archives, and there's a handful of places where even our prophets, seers, and revelators have stated that God is disappointed. Now, right? what do they know? <laughs> well, and And... I'm uh, so, and he gave. I think there's a quote by Elder Renland saying that he references God's disappointment at times with us. So and you're a heretic. I, I I may be a heretic, and I do joke that you know I, I'm not a BYU professor. I'm not even academic. I can write a book full of heresy. So, um, <laughs> but my point being is that 
a big problem I think we miss in our exploration and understanding of the gospel is we often go to this place of, I want to know the truth. What's the doctrine, right? You'll hear this term of, we need to teach doctrine at church, which I agree with. However, you can take a true doctrine and frame it so incorrectly that now it doesn't matter. It's not necessarily false doctrine. It's true doctrine framed falsely. And that can be a huge problem for people. Like I go back to the you know, the, the, the doctrine of eternal families, like the, con- the, the phrase families are forever, like, and we even have primary songs about this. Mm-hmm. But, that, but that, can be, that can be a problematic doctrine if it's, if it's framed incorrectly. So it, some people read that and say families are forever, and to me, I read that as a state of being, a state of exaltation, which is beautiful and, and definitely uh, is, is why that doctrine is so beautiful. Others can take it as it's a geographical uh, issue of like families are forever. That means if we're not if we're not sealed, then we're not going to literally live together. Or that family member who uh, is apostate, you know, they'll live some in some far off place in the eternities, and maybe maybe not be able to visit. I don't know. And so it becomes this doctrine of sadness of like, isn't that bad that little Jimmy is is no longer a part of our family? And I'm like, what? So we frame it. It's not a geographical doctrine. It's not saying that. No, literally, the families are going to be together only if they're sealed, and, 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 and that's a poor framing of it. But if we frame it in a context of exaltation, and that, that we're entering into a covenant, into an order with God to be exalted, like that's a very redemptive doctrine. It's an encouraging doctrine. So my intent of with, is God disappointed? I'm framing grace in a way that is encouraging and helpful. Now, everything I say in here is an absolute full doctrinal. Again, I may, I tried to attempt that. You didn't go through the correlation department. I did not I did not go through the correlation department. I mean, I'm sure they'd have some problems with things. But my point here is that I'm not trying to write a book that is 100% true as much as it is frames the doctrine in a way that is very encouraging and it can encourage people to stick with it longer, right? Um and so I want to frame a God. Do I do I know absolutely that God has never been disappointed or he can't feel that? Well, no. I I mean, I believe that truly, but can I prove it with doctrine and quotes and scriptures? Well, not necessarily. But if if I if we do have a God full of grace and he sent his son and his son's sacrifice was sufficient, then why would he ever need uh disappointment or or motivating any of us through disappointment? Because disappointment is directly connected to shame, which I believe is the is Satan's strongest tool uh, in corrupting our identity and steering us off the the covenant path yeah and so going back to some of your episodes that's been one of the enlightening things that I've noticed because I will tell you and maybe it's just my age <laughs> I got tired of hearing all the talks about pornography and don't do it and you know, <laughs> Y'all are bad if you do it and that sort of thing. But in your podcast, you really, with some of the experts that I've heard you talk to, and I can't name them off the top of my head. You probably know them better than me. But they've, they've said the same thing, that shame is the problem. Mm-hmm. Um, can you talk more about that issue yeah. specifically? Yeah. If, um, a great way, I've heard this from other recovering addicts or people who struggle with pornography, is that pornography is not necessarily the problem for people. It's the solution for people. They don't know how to cope with life, and whether it's their background, their history, um, the pressures of life, they don't know how to cope with that. And so they turn to pornography as the solution. And uh, it's so common in not just our faith tradition or others to be very behavior-first focused. Obviously, the scriptures talk all about the change of heart, that we should give our heart to God. It's very heart-focused. However, the way we often lead or preach our, our doctrine is behavior focus. Just get the pornography fixed, and then your heart can be changed, yeah. right? And then you're converted, right? Or just, you know, all these behaviors, like if you just stop it and pray more and, and focus on the good behaviors, then you'll have a change of heart. When in reality, the scriptures show just the opposite. Christ didn't go to the Pharisees and say, hey, you guys got the behaviors figured out. Why don't you be my disciples? No, he went to fishermen and said, Look, you, the, the, your behaviors are out of whack, and I'm not that he said this, but like I want you to be my disciples, and then their behaviors changed, right? He went to to Saul and said, you know, why why persecutes me? Like follow me, and then his behaviors changed, right? And then he got that new identity, and so 
oftentimes in our in our leadership or in our parenting or we we start with the behavior thing because that's something we can do. If if you know you tell you tell your your children or you, you, someone encourages you go change the heart of your children. You're like, okay, like that? how do I? Do, you got like what do I do right? But if they come to you say go go encourage your people your children to, to act or behave differently. They're like, oh, I know how to do that. I'll go, you know, we'll make the checklist and we'll do the, you know, the chore chart. We'll do the the scripture study chart. We'll do that. And that gives me something to do. And this is the the difficult thing about this mortal experience is that God wants us to give us our heart, but we don't necessarily know how to do that, right? And so we default to behaviors. And a lot of people have a lot of criticism for like the temple recommend questions. You know, why why all these standards and worthiness? Like isn't isn't what doesn't Jesus want us to come to his temple? Well, what the church is trying to do is measure heart, and there's just not a lot of good indicators. They want to measure conversion and, and commitment, and there's not a lot of good indicators to do that. So bless their heart, they're they're trying to use a mechanism to at least get them close. And so a lot of the the temple recommend questions are behavior focused, but just because that's that's the best thing they can do with with the resources they have, even though we're tr- we're striving to measure heart, and then God will will engage in, and change our behaviors. So is it a problem, because I've, I've heard the church has kind of a checklist mentality. Well, I did my home teaching, I did mm-hmm. my visiting teaching, you know, I gave the casserole to the neighbor, whatever. Um, is, does our church focus too much on checklists and not enough on grace? I would say every church, every human dynamic that we experience mortality just by nature, we're wired that way to say, well, what are the behaviors? Because we have no other way of measuring of measuring the heart, right? So, yeah, the, oftentimes the, we have a program or ministering or temple work of, I mean, the purpose of the temple isn't so that we can practice to check the check boxes so much that we're like experts at checking boxes. Obviously, there's a transformational th- uh, experience in the temple. Um and so I would say the short answer is, yeah, sometimes we can fall into this trap of behaviors. And, and sometimes it's, it's not necessarily the church is forcing it upon us as much as we think, oh, that's the program. That's what I'm supposed to do. That's the expectation. And, it's the, and when we're given an expectation or we interpret something in an expectation, that's the, that's the trap. And I truly believe that God has zero expectations in us. That's probably the biggest controversial heresy that I, I mentioned wow. in the book. I didn't that, think we were going to get heresy here. <laughs> this is great. But no, I, I truly believe it because the um, a lot of people say, well, what about the commandments and covenants? God didn't give us commandments and covenants to measure our worth. He didn't give us commandments and covenants as, as some mortal obstacle course to say, okay, let's see how you do this time. I'm timing it. Ready, go. No, he gave us commandments and covenants to refine us and to give us a workshop where we can enter in and become more like him. Not to measure our worth or be like, oh, you're really, you're really uh, dropping the ball. You, you're, you don't deserve to be in my presence. He says, come to me. Let's figure this out. And that's the beauty of it. When I feel the grace of Jesus Christ, that I'm accepted completely today, even if I never changed again, I can't help but turn to him and say, how do I change? How do I become like you? Right? And this is the paradox of the God that we worship. And as mortals, it's so difficult, even especially as parents, to think like, wait a minute, like, well, we can't like completely accept everybody, right? Because then they'll take it as license just to never try again. But that's the paradox of grace. It is the most motivating force that we have, but we can't help but to turn to shame and, and wow. try and motivate people that way. Am I talking to a Lutheran? <laughs> <laughs> and maybe maybe that that's bled into my my theology a little bit too much. But. So I feel like I have to pl- play the orthodox guy, and you're the unorthodox Let's do it. guy here. So as we tie this into, let's say, the Bible, you know, um, it says in Exodus that um, God repented because the people were so evil, and He wanted to destroy them. Same thing with Noah. That Noah was, or God was angry with the people, and we got to wipe out the whole earth. So, how does that tie into your story of grace? <laughs> yeah, the, the Old Testament God is a tough one to reconcile, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, he sure seems angry, and I get, and I get this, right? That people saying like, "Well, Kurt, like, listen, like, I can find scripture after scripture that God seems pretty angry. He seems disappointment. Like, Doctrine and Covenants section three, Joseph Smith loses the manuscript, like." He's pretty mad. He, he, he seemed pretty mad there, right? And we we read it in this tone. We make that assumption. We read 
section three in this condemning tone. But if you ask a sweet grandmother to read that section, it would sound so encouraging. Would like, it? it? Absolutely. Because like, I your, know in your, your ways, book, uh-huh. in chapter one or two, uh-huh. I can't remember, you had a paragraph that was all caps, and I think uh-huh. it was about losing the 116 yeah, pages. section three. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. But yeah. God says there, your ways aren't my ways. You can't disrupt this work, right? And then the rest of the section is so encouraging. And so God will be a coach when he needs to get at our level and say, listen, this needs to change. You're, you're down a path that leads to destruction. And I want to be very clear, as I am in the book, sin will destroy people. Like if you invest in a life in sin or just think, uh, you have license to sin, sin will destroy you. Um, the point being is that God first lays a foundation of love, acceptance, and grace, and then he can come to us and, and correct us, right? And it's in that relationship that, that we are able to overcome these things and these weaknesses. The problem is that many times as mortals or as leaders, we default to the, to, to the shame script of the, you need to do better, right? I'm like, you don't even know me. You don't even know why... I, I sin, right? Why I struggle with these things. And all you come at me is what I need to do better, right? But God, the, the, the Bible and scriptures are, are full of those messages of, of grace and encouragement. And yeah, there's those, those stories, but I would say, yeah, at that moment, he needed to be an eternal coach to you. He needed to his people and, and correct them, right? So, so he's, uh, we're going to use some sports terminology. He's a Pete Carroll rather than a Bill Parcells, Bobby Knight. <laughs> yeah, maybe. That's right. That's right. Because, uh, um, I mean, I, I'm not just, this isn't just some flowery grace message of like, oh, you're just love, like, bless your yeah. heart, you just do your best, whatever. No, like, God is wanting us to develop and, and progress, and this is maybe where I leave the Lutherans behind, is that uh, works do do matter. Like, they have a purpose and a role. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Kurt Frankham, the author of Is God Disappointed Than Me? Make sure you sign up to gospeltangents.com slash contest if you want a chance to win one of three copies autographed of this. In our next conversation, we're going to talk with Kurt about his work with Jeff McCullough from Hello Saints, and also if God can dwell in unclean temples. He just wanted to give me an array the best he could, even though there's probably, there's so many different options even between all they were all here in utah yeah they're all here in utah and so um i went on that journey to just get my and he recorded my response to it and and you know i said all the things i really appreciated and some things that i missed about our faith tradition and so it was a fun experiment thanks for listening and i hope you to continue to enjoy gospel tangents consider becoming a patreon or go to gospeltangents.com slash shop and you can get a cool tie a hat or even a nice mug. You can also get a sweatshirt. So check it out at gospeltangents.com shop.